Hello and welcome to the show. Now, well, after a long time, social activist on my show, Yusuf Abaramji. I've been trailing him for a while. I've been following his stories. I've been looking at his life's journey, and now it's a journey encapsulated in a particular publication which I think you're calling the Coffee Table Publication, Hajj 2016, but we're going to talk about that. But before I go there, I like going into the aspects of what comprises a particular person, why I find them interesting, and then to understand their work. Yusuf, welcome to the show. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, Brother Faisal, and, and lovely being in the Dean TV studios uh, here Finally. in Cape Town. Finally. Finally. Shukran. Well, it's uh, our pleasure, I must say. Now, we, we look at this publication that you recently put out there and, and people have been following what you've been doing from the Hajj and then to encapsulate that in a particular book, as you might say. But before we go there, I sort of want to delve into you as a person. I know that we have an interesting journey there. Where did all that start and how do you define Yusuf? Well, uh, I'm from uh, the capital city of Pretoria, born and bred in Pretoria, did my schooling there. Uh, became a teacher at the Transvaal College of Education. Always wanted to be a journalist from a very young age. Uh, I suppose comes from my father and grandfather, uh, always reading the newspapers and listening to the radio. Um, and after a year, became a spokesman for the Department of Education in the Administration House of Delegates. Uh, subsequently, uh, joined the SABC as a parliamentary reporter, uh, became a sub-editor in Johannesburg, uh, went back to my community uh, where I launched a uh, community newspaper, revived it, uh, and then subsequently joined uh, Talk Radio 702 uh, as a young freelance reporter in Pretoria. And over the past 21 years, uh, I was with the company uh, in various positions, uh, full-time reporter, acting news editor, crime editor, uh, became the station manager of 702 and then the head of news and current affairs and also very actively involved in the establishment of the civil society movement uh, called Lead South Africa and Crime Line. Uh, and yes, in December last year I decided to move on uh, and wanted to be my own boss for a change and uh, alhamdulillah uh, a year later uh, that's exactly what I'm doing, consulting, doing social cohesion, uh, the CEO sleep out I'm actively involved in and trying to do a bit of good with projects like these, trying to do a bit of charity in a very small way. So uh, that's, a, that's a quick round circle, but a very active and busy one and sort of having your tentacles into everything. Very interesting. But uh, tell us about the family life. Uh, how do you cope with all of that? amidst what you do? Well, I think keeping a balance is important. And as you know, with, with a media fraternity, being a journalist for the largest chunk of my life, um, you have very little family time, you have very little commitment. Every day is different and that is what uh, kept me going over the years so that in the morning, as much as you have a diary, your diary changes at very short notice, you change your plans, uh, you have to go out and network. Um, and I think that these are challenges that we have every day. And I often say to my friends and to, and to, and to the people out there, uh, when you get up in the morning and you don't feel like going to work because you're not enjoying it, go and find a new job. Uh, because I think that is what, what, what we need in whatever we do, uh, whether you're a social activist, whether you're a magistrate, whether you're a teacher, whether you're a social worker, is you need to put your heart and your passion into what you do, otherwise you won't get job satisfaction. Correct is, uh, well they say that people that do what they want to do and live what they do, they never really work a particular day Absolutely. because they're not at work. Yeah. And I suppose you in that, so people wonder why at 11 o'clock at night you're still doing what you do, but that's because you're not really working, that's just you. We have to pay the rental, Faisal, we have to pay the bill, so as much as we're doing it uh, for out of love and, and, and the passion, uh, and that, that is a core in what we're doing. And I think that is why I always talk of the philosophy of becoming an active citizen. We know the government of South Africa, the National Development Plan, talks about becoming an active citizen. And really every individual, whether you're fighting crime, whether you're fighting corruption, whether you want leadership, uh, whether you're assisting charities, is if you put your heart and your soul to it and we put South Africa first, we'll be able to make a difference, I believe. 100%. And I see today you came decked out in your South African uh, flag slash t-shirt and uh, so I know that you take activism and you take brand South Africa very seriously. Indeed, I think it's important for us. I think it's important for us to have national pride. When you're patriotic to the country doesn't mean you're patriotic to the government or the president. Um, and I often say the government will get our support when they deserve it. 
Uh, they will get our criticism when they deserve it. But the first thing we must remember is that we are South African. We were born here. Our, f our f grandfathers were born here. Many of us, our fathers were born here. Uh, our mums were born here. And we need to put South Africa first. And I think being patriotic, uh, when you talk about Ubuntu, when you talk about the, the, the uh, national anthem, uh, when you talk about the South African flag, we have to be proud South Africans. And as you know, uh, I've been very passionate about driving a number of initiatives like Football Friday, Protea Friday, um, the Olympic Friday, and so on, because I believe national pride is so important. I mean, ev I even went as far as uh, having a kurta um, uh, during my two book launches in Johannesburg and Cape Town uh, with my logo, which is the South African flag colors. I, uh, I saw that, yeah. I, that. That really makes you feel proud to be South African because uh, let's be proud, we are South African. What a beautiful country. Uh, as much as we have uh, problems, the government calls them challenges, um, I think that uh, we all need to be proud South Africans. Correct, yes. So you go on Hajj now in 2016. And you, you come back and you publish this particular publication, which we are showing our viewers uh, right now. Where did that idea come from? You say it's your first Hajj, but was the idea or the intention to share that journey with everyone? Or did that sort of come along as you were on the journey itself? I haven't been for Hajj. Uh, it was my first Hajj. I, I went on Umrah eight years ago. Um, I decided that I want to go on Hajj and Alhamdulillah, um, I often say that um, it's not the Saudi embassy, they might give you a physical visa, but you go to the kingdom, to the holy land at the invitation of, of the Almighty. Um, I applied for accreditation to Sahuk. I waited for many, many years. I wasn't accredited. Uh, my name didn't come on a list this year. And luckily, um, I approached the uh, embassy in Pretoria and they afforded uh, us courtesy visas. Um, and, uh, and that made it possible. I may add that I, I've been invited as a guest of the kingdom over the years as a journalist, as part of the King's program. I never took up the invitations for a number of reasons because I thought my first search I want to go on my own steam. Um, two weeks before I left Faisal, uh, the ambassador called me and said that they have a Saudi TV crew in South Africa. They would like to follow one pilgrim, his journey right from the home into the airport, into the kingdom. And they wanted to know whether I would be able to, to assist them. And I kindly agreed, very reluctantly, I may add, and they chose one pilgrim from Cape Town. I then accompanied them on the flight on Saudi Airlines uh, to the kingdom. We arrived there, we did some filming. Uh, and then I said goodbye to them in Medina. Uh, my intention was never to go and publish a coffee table book during this journey. Oh, wait, wait. You, said, you said goodbye to them in Medina? Yeah. Or, or are you saying you didn't follow through with that? No, no, no. I mean, that was where the program ended because they wanted to show it in Medina. I mean, they didn't want to, it was just following the, 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 the journey from South Africa into... Oh, into I see. So it, wa it wasn't... It wasn't the, the Hajj. It wasn't, it okay, wasn't right. Hajj. It, was a, it was a run up to the, to the Hajj. Um, I never intended publishing a coffee table book. Had I in, they had the intention of coming back with a book, I would have taken a good camera with me, uh, possibly a video camera, and believe it or not, I took my uh, iPhone 6 Plus, uh, this is now the iPhone 7, and all the photos I took along the journey uh, as part of my tweet just, and just, just part of my Facebook. Just while you mentioned the iPhone. Uh, you specifically chose the iPhone no. for quality purposes. I've so always been an iPhone fan. Okay. Uh, I've always carried an iPhone, thank you. And I, <laughs> they take us nowadays. And I even have the iPhone, and I don't get paid royalties or endorsement fees, by the way. In fact, I don't even get my phone free of charge. <laughs> exactly. Um, what happened was, um, and I thought I'm going to have a quiet touch. That was my intention. Arrived in Jeddah on Saudi Airlines. Went through uh, the Hajj terminal, very friendly immigration people, only seven people on this flight, only seven people in the Hajj terminal. And I asked them, is it, is it time for Hajj? Because in all the, the horror stories are here. I read it in the wrong country. Oh, I read it, I read it in the wrong country. Uh, Janubi Africa, uh, immigration officials, very friendly. Mandela, we try to speak with broken English uh, to them um, because we don't talk Arabic fluently. Um, then made our way to, to Medina. But before we went to Medina, a friend of mine, uh, who's the uh, anchor, uh, uh, presenter on SAFM, who does the media f show, Ashraf Garda, sent me a message on WhatsApp to say, I love your, your, your tweet. Why don't you just start a hashtag, Hajj2016 uh, and Abramji on Hajj, and share your journey, which, which I did with a few tweets. And before I knew, not thinking much, about not thinking much and before I knew, um, hundreds of tweets went out. Uh, wherever I could get chance along the journey during the ziyarat, the touring, uh, be it at the tomb of our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, uh, the architecture of the Haram in Medina, 
um, and, and, and the rest is history. Um, I tweeted, I Facebooked, I did live video footage across so, so uh, along the way. Uh, listening and watching the response of the public was perhaps a good measure to understand that this is something that they want to see. I think uh, the, the, the one idea, uh, with the minute I started sharing my journey, a lot of non-Muslims uh, uh, responded by saying, please tell us more. Uh, what does it mean to pray at the tomb of the beloved Prophet? You ask him, uh, you ask the Almighty that the Prophet uh, intercede on our behalf on the Day of Judgment. And you were trying to, I was trying to explain the whole thing. I mean, even the Ahram, uh, tried to take a Wikipedia link and show it, uh, explain what the Ahram is about. What is Tawaf? Why do you walk around seven times? Why do you go to Mina? Why do you do, uh, what is the most important day of Hajj, the day of Arafah and so on. Um, let me fast forward. Arrived back uh, four weeks later, had about 1,200 photographs on this phone. Uh, my storage was getting full. I went to my dear friend, Yasin Teba, who is uh, involved in marketing and branding. And I said to him, Yasin, take, do me a favor. Uh, take these 1,200 photos, download it, you tech savvy, download it for me, keep it in an archive. One day when I need them, I'll, I'll use them, which he uh, happily did for me. And he called me the next morning and he said, you know, how did you take, did you take all these photos on your, on, your, on your phone, on your camera phone? I said, yes. He said, I can't believe it. The quality is outstanding. Why don't we publish a book? And I actually laughed. I said, come on, Yasin, you must be joking. Uh, he then got hold of a, of a friend of his, uh, Muhammad Ismail from Custom Islamic Art. Uh, he gave him the brief um, and he said, yes, we're publishing a book. Uh, they worked uh, almost 24 hours uh, for a few days putting the, the book together, which has 400 uh, uh, photographs of my journey, which they chose right from the beginning at home, uh, into Jidda, into Medina, the Ziyarats, back to uh, Jidda, into Mecca, the five days of Hajj, and then back from the airport in Jidda to Oar Tembo. And, um, and here we are, you know, uh, I, went to, I went to my dear friend, uh, Muhammad uh, uh, Farouk Hussein from Lodium, an educationist, he did some of the contributing writing. And then lastly, I went to my niece, the new editor of the Mail and Guardian, uh, Katija Patel, and I said to my niece, uh, you are publishing, you are editing my book free of charge. And all of them are, uh, did it free of charge. And um, believe it or not, in a record time of, of two and a half, three weeks, from the date that we started with the layout, uh, it was printed. Don't ask me how it was done. Amazing. The um, printer, Bashir Hafeji from Neon Printers, uh, did it at cost price. Um, and we launched in Johannesburg, we launched in Cape Town, and uh, inshallah we'll be launching in Durban. And here we have it, and all proceeds from the book phase are going to OCAF South Africa and Crescent Lifestyle for their Hajj Workoff. And inshallah, uh, if people buy this book for 750 Rand, you'll be making it easier for oh. destitute pilgrims to go on Hajj inshallah next year. You, you know what I find interesting is that we're in a very strange time. And the strange time is that, um, you know, oddly enough, two, three days ago, I gave my mother, you know when you, you're standing at the Taj Mahal, these photographers come up to you and they take these actual photos and as you leave the area, they'll come and sell you those pictures. Correct. So we bought some of those photos and I never saw a real photo probably for the last 10 years, I think, I'm not sure, um, because we're so electronic and especially if we have an iPhone, you know, everything is just yeah. electronic. But when I showed her and I said, oh, here's my photos from the Taj Mahal, I, I saw her looking at it and really trying to to, to, to scan through those pictures and appreciated the actual print. So she appreciated the print because she's from another era altogether. Sure. And so we've buggered up history mm -hmm. by, by having everything electronic and saying, Mommy, here's a photo of, of, of this and this is happening at the office. But there's, when we walk away with our cell phones, there's nothing to, to ponder about or, exactly. or keep. And I get that sense of that and that feeling when I have this book in my hand. And that is, I think that I also now appreciate physically scanning through something or looking at it and saying look at these wonderful pictures because you don't get that sense it's there on your phone and you're able to carry it with you but you don't get that sense of having a picture like this and something this huge for example of the Jamarats or something in your hand and I think you, you're bridging that gap with a lot of people. Well I think that was the idea um, the, the idea was twofold first of all to, to inspire Muslims who haven't been on Hajj to undertake this journey. And hopefully, inshallah, in a very small way, it will 
inspire, in fact, it has already inspired a number of people that are now applying for accreditation to go for Hajj. People that have been on Hajj, to keep it as a souvenir, um, Dr. Iqbal Silvey brought his mom to the Cape Town launch and she was on Hajj 30 years ago. Uh, when she compares her memories of 30 years ago to all the changes we are now seeing, it brings back a lot of memories for the Hujaj. For non-Muslims, it is uh, to show them what the religion is about. We know that very often Islam, we are dubbed as terrorists, we are called uh, uh, we, jihadists. We, jihadists, we know that Islamophobia is rife. And the idea with the book is also to showcase what our religion and what Hajj is about. Hajj is about all standing united. It's about people coming together peacefully. And I think it's important for us to educate the world. And let's be very straightforward and honest about it. The Hajj will make the news if there's a stampede, mm -hmm. if there is a fire, if there is a terror attack. It will be headlines all over the world. Uh, Hajj 2016 or Hajj 1437, Alhamdulillah, we didn't have a single incident that made the world headlines. And, and why didn't uh, Hajj make the headlines? Because the media, as we know internationally, wants sensationalism to, to, to thrive. And I thought another good reason why we need to put Hajj on the map. And believe it or not, um, since I came back and I made this thing, uh, the, the, the intention of the book clear, the publication, it has been all over South Africa. Print media has been reporting it, electronic media, both radio and television. Um, and, and really, I think the feedback I've had is just amazing. I had a, a Christian uh, lady at the launch in Cape Town and she sent me a, a very interesting message last night. She says, I want to explore your religion much more. Mm -hmm. The event has inspired me. That's that has really filled me with joy to say that is the intention. And, and just that one incident alone, Correct. you'd say that my mission is complete. No, that, that was the one. The other one was during the journey, Faisal. Uh, somebody sent me a tweet, also a Christian, and said that uh, you've made me more religiously conscious uh, by sharing your her journey. Uh, aside from the fact that a number of Muslims were saying, thank you for bringing back our memories, we wish we were on Hajj or Umrah again, etc. And I think that is the idea, is we educate and we inform, and more importantly, we use social media to our advantage. Social media can be quite a distraction. Um, we know that very often people use it for the wrong reasons, but if you use social media responsibly, uh, like, for example, sharing your journey and putting it into what we've done here, I think, alhamdulillah, it will, it will really go a long way in, in trying to inspire people could to really so do good. So, so most of my viewers know that uh, I've been away uh, in India for a couple of weeks and uh, we were sort of tweeting everything. But the funny thing is now that I came back, wherever people see me, they say, I followed your journey. Uh, I saw you on the elephants. I saw that. So people do follow that because I think it's a sense of escapism. Uh, I think many people don't always get the opportunities uh, to go on Hajj and, and to go to India and these places. And if you can share those journeys, I think that's an important I thing. Think, let me just add, Faisal, and I think that that is what we as, as journalists or uh, media fraternity people do. We've got a great following on, on all the social media platforms. And that following is, is almost like a cult following. It, uh, it reminds me of my dear friend Mufti Ismail Mank, yeah. uh, who was in Cape Town when I had presented a book to him at uh, Masjid e Quds uh, during the Juma talk. Yes. And I said to him, uh, Mufti Sab, you've got a million followers on Twitter, you've got 500,000 on Instagram, you've got about 2 million on Facebook. All I need from you is one tweet or a retweet that will probably sell me a few thousand books. And Alhamdulillah, he did it. But it shows the power of social media, Great. especially people with a standing. Um, to share their journeys, to share their stories, but more importantly, to do some good. And I think doing good should become part of our, uh, our daily exactly. life. Something else that stands out about this for me is that is the future. Uh, the future from the perspective of, you said that um, Dr. Iqbal Surve's mother uh, came into the environment and she reflected on the past. And that would naturally happen because I think everybody that's been for Hajj or Umrah reflects on what they saw at the time. But the interesting thing about this is that when it's 2026, people might open the book and say, you know, my, this was my grandfather's book and look what the place looked like then. So this is a timeless piece. It's a capture in time. And I, and I think that's something that we need to think about. Interestingly enough, that was a point that Dr. Suve made yesterday, uh, oh. not yesterday, during the launch in Cape Town, uh, where he said, you know, in 20 years time, uh, when people go through their coffee table books and see, uh, you know what, can you believe it, how things have changed? And let's give credit to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. I mean, the infrastructure, the security, the, uh, the whole operation of Hajj has really improved. Um, and you can't believe it, even people that were on Hajj five years ago said, I can't, I can't believe how things have changed. Um, and yes, you know, uh, we talk of the Olympic Games, we talk of the World Cup. 
uh, it compares nothing to the Hajj because here we are on the plains of Arafat uh, hundreds of thousands of people in fact this year it was the lowest figure by the way in, in almost 10 years there were only 1,8 million people compared to 3-4 million people going on a Hajj and if you stand there, even with 1,8 million people, you ask yourself, how does it all fall into place? And I think it's because of the mercy of the Almighty that makes sure that everything just happens. Of course. Now, uh, that's a very interesting point because uh, about three years ago, three, four years ago, uh, we hosted my resign in Cape Town. And I was his MC and I was involved with um, the event at the, Cape, at the stadium. So there's 13,000 people in the stadium. It's weeks of planning. Mm -hmm. It's uh, days and hours of no sleep. And then there's two weeks of resting after that because of the show. Mm -hmm. And assimilate that to the millions of people that come into a country that require services. It's mind boggling. You know, you know, Faisal. The one thing which uh, you, uh, which is still difficult to 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 bring to, to come to grips with is how does it all fall into place? Uh, the bus is moving in one direction. Um, fine, we have the the, the tourists, uh, the tour the, the tourism companies. We have uh, the uh, travel agents that that guide and and, and show the people what to do. Um, and really that feeling is amazing. I mean, we talk of the national anthem, the national anthem of the Hajj being the Lebeik. Uh, when you when you when you recite the Lebeik during the Hajj period, uh, it fills you with so much joy because we, we are proclaiming, "Here I am, here I am, my Lord." Lebeik, Allahumma Lebeik, Lebeik, La Sharika, Laka Lebeik, Inna Alhamda, Wadni Mata, Laka Wal Mulk. Um, when you stand at Arafat, uh, dressed in two pieces of white cloth called the Ihram, uh, on your left hand side might be a judge from Kenya, on your uh, uh, other side might be a teacher from, from Afghanistan. Behind you might be an unemployed person from Nigeria. In front of you uh, might be a cabinet minister from another part of the world. No rich, no poor, no black, no white. We are all equal. And let's not forget the Kaaba being the central, the central point, the central focus of our religion. We five times a day face in the direction of the Kaaba. As much as we have differences, we always fight and we fight amongst ourselves. But there are three words bring us all together or two words bring us all together Allah work but Allah is great and I think things like these when you reflect really puts focus on us as, as, uh, as Muslims to show what our religion is about and again with a coffee table book we've seen it in South Africa you know being a social cohesion advocate um, I asked for for donors to sponsor uh, books to be given out free to school libraries, to municipal libraries, to the national library. In Johannesburg, we raised about 275,000 rand at the launch. And in Cape Town, a well-known businessman, uh, Neil De Beer, stood up and said, I'm buying 100 books for libraries in the Western Cape. And he made the point, I'm Christian. Yes. But yet, this book is not only about the Muslims, it's about bringing people together. It's about sharing what your religion is about. What is all about? Great. Yusuf, uh, you as a personality, in conclusion, uh, I think that a lot of people follow what you do and you've been there done that in many spaces and today we find uh, a host of youngsters coming up sometimes not very sure uh, what direction in life to take. We find influences uh, on the social level, we find influences on political levels. So we have um, microsystems, mesosystems, all these systems that influence the way that youth develop today and uh, the challenge is there. So like you say, government calls them challenges. What's your advice to, in, to youth, to inspire them to, to go out there, embrace South Africa and embrace their space as Muslims and their identity within South Africa? Well, I think the first thing I often say is that we must be proud Muslims. You might be a judge, you might be a teacher, you might be an editor, you might be a journalist. Uh, the one thing we need to be very proud of, Faisal, is we, we are proud that we are Muslim. And we must use the powerful standings that we have in our community to showcase our religion. We know that among the youth today, the problems of drugs are rampant. Unemployment is a problem. I can sit here the whole day and give you a list of all the problems that we have. But I often say, if we want to take South Africa forward, if you want to take your own personal growth forward, there are three priorities for me. Priority number one is education. Priority number two is education. And priority number three is education. Mm -hmm. If we want to be successful in life, please make sure that we educate ourselves and we educate our children. That will take us forward, not only for personal growth, it will take our country forward, and inshallah we'll be able to come out as better human beings because education makes a difference. Yusuf, yes, thank you for coming onto the show. It's been truly inspiring. We wish you all of the best for the future. Shukran Faisal, lovely being on Dean TV. and you well as well. Shukran. Thank you.
Yusuf Bramji and uh, our social activist and now author of this particular book, if I can say author. Um, but uh, uh, I must say it's been an interesting journey, just the interview alone. And uh, we do hope that you will join Yusuf on his journey by purchasing one of these because lots of it is going to funds that benefit society until next time.